We're going to start with Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. For years, I was saying that this refers to the Laodicean church, to the fact that they were rich, increased in goods, and that the Lord was outside trying to get back in. I've had to repent of that. For that that's not. This, the Lord is within the church and he's very active. This is saying something quite different. This is at the end of the message to the seven churches. The door is closed because there's nothing any further on the earth realm. We're at the closing out of the church age. We are literally in a time of transition. The Lord is preparing a kingdom people, getting a people ready for that which he's about to do. Because the Lord will return at the end of the church age, the beginning of the kingdom age, he's at the door. He's knocking to attract our attention to the urgency of the hour. There's nothing any further horizontally. But the word of the Lord is this. After this, in Revelation chapter 4, I looked and a door was opened in the heavens. That is, we're called into a heavenly participation where the kingdoms of this world are about to become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. That's us, the anointing. The word Christ is the Greek form of the Hebrew word Messiah. It means the, the Messiah, the Lord himself, but it also means or includes the anointed of the Lord. We're his body, the church. And so the word of the Lord is this, come up, come up. Come up out of the earthly, look upward, onward, come up and I will show you things which must be hereafter. And I have been praying this, and I believe that the Lord is beginning to unfold his purpose in this. If anyone hears my voice, this is, this is where we are right now, this is the burden. The preparation of a people that are going to hear. If any, if, that's conditional, that means there's something on our part that we're to be prepared to get ready for that. If, that means we may not. So then if we're to hear his voice, it takes an effort on our part. We've got to become available and we have to begin to listen. If anyone hears, he is speaking, he is speaking. The problem is not in the Lord speaking, it's in our hearing. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door. Now we're just going to just, just work at this a little bit, directly, indirectly. We've been here at some of the meetings, but I, I just want to be sure because I just have this inner burden. It's almost like a pain. It's, it, it's, it's intercessory, but it's more than that. It's, it's a desire for a body of believers in the greater Washington, D.C. area that are available to the Lord for an end time purpose for the transition, for that which the Lord is about to do, that there'll be a body of believers. Now for just a moment, we're gonna look at Acts chapter one, another verse that's beginning to open up differently than I had seen it for years. Acts chapter one and verse eight. I want to read verse 11 first. Ye men of Galilee, this is Acts chapter 1 and verse 11. Ye men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go. I want to share something about this. After the resurrection, Jesus began to appear, appeared to Mary, then to, then to uh, some of the to Peter and James, and then to others, or John, and then to others. He, he appeared and began to walk with two on the road towards Emmaus, two discouraged disciples. He would appear in a meeting. The believers of that day were confused by the crucifixion. They, I'm sure that they thought or fully expected Jesus to come down off the cross in a show of power 
and glory and he didn't and he died and they were confused and they were hiding behind closed doors but all at once Jesus would appear and those confused Christians of that day became a mighty force that turned the world of that day upside down and I believe that at the very root of the power that came into the early church was the fact that Jesus appeared so then for 40 days after the resurrection Jesus appeared began appearing in all the different places he began appearing at the end of 40 days he gave the promise tarry for 10 days then he was taken up now if he comes in the same way in the reverse of that then for a 40 day period that's Jacob's trouble the time that it's it, there, there's a it could be 40 days 40 years it, it's in God's timing but this same Jesus just as you see him go he didn't resurrect him and and go up but instead he spent what 40 days appearing to the believers of his time therefore if he comes back in the same way what is he going to do he's going to begin what appearing, appearing to to the believers to those glory thank you Lord so he's going to begin appearing to those that he's getting ready for the end time I've been saying this recently the church of our day the world the world of our day considers the church to be something like a mosquito bite it itches a little bit but it'll go away in other words the world considers the church to be a nuisance but they're in for a rude awakening hallelujah see before there's any appearing of the Lord openly manifestly as the world's expecting the Lord through the present day church is going to reveal his power his glory and again he's getting a people ready through whom he's going to reveal his power and his glory and that people is who that's us by the grace of God that's why we're here because the Lord's preparing getting a people ready for that now you shall receive power after so I'm using a King James not when power is never a gift they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength when is it renewed after you do what wait. after you wait that's right after you wait Jesus went into the wilderness he was driven into the wilderness he came up from the waters of baptism he went into the wilderness in the fullness of the spirit but he came out in the power what was in between 40 days 40 days so power you shall receive power not when but after after we've gone through testing proving after we have qualified through the dealings the workings of God the breakings where our spirits all self-ambition has been dealt with in every previous move where the Lord has attempted to move those who were recipients of that grace that anointing literally exploited it they built ministries names for themselves around it but in the last day it's the head that's to be seen and glorified the body being covered the Lord is to be revealed the Lord is preparing a people that he can trust with authority now he shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come on you and you shall be not do witnessing the old Pentecostal cliche if you've been in Pentecostal churches for a while you probably heard this the baptism in the Holy Spirit is power for service well that's, that's service is something you do 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 this says ye shall what be not do be that means it's not something I do it's something that I am becoming I'm becoming a witness I'm becoming a sample a demonstration an expression of the Lord himself ye shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem Judea Samaria to the uttermost part of the earth now there's something interesting and this is what the Lord is showing me recently Jesus ministered for approximately three years there was an intensity of ministry multitudes were healed delivered set free Josephus in his church history says that there was the greatest explosion of satanic activity during the lifetime of Jesus that this world had ever seen 
But Jesus ministered, the dead were raised, the blind saw, the, de the deaf or the deaf heard. They heard the miracles. And Jesus said this, the works that I do, you shall do what? Also, and what? Greater. Now we can't do anything greater than that, really than what Jesus did. We really can't do anything greater, but, but it is greater. Now, Jesus, now this is a profound statement. If you can hear what I'm saying, it will challenge you, give direction and purpose to your life right now in anticipation for what the Lord is about to do. Because this is a profound statement. Jesus, I don't know how tall he was, but he was not presumptuous. He's not six foot six or, you know, big muscular. I don't believe that. He's a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form or comeliness. When we see him, there's no beauty that we will desire. See, you had to know him by the Spirit. So I'm going to say five foot eight. <laughs> five foot eight. I, I really don't know. But we're going to say Jesus was about five foot eight. That means singularly, he ministered for three years. That ministry led to the cross. The intensity of that ministry. It provoked the religious people of that day and they crucified him on the cross. The intensity of that ministry led to the cross. But in the last days, this same Jesus, just as you see him go, part of his going was his ministry, his life, the sacrifice of his life at the cross the witness that he gave to this earth, and then he was taken up. If we reverse that, then there is a ministry, an end time ministry, that's about to happen in the earth. The greater ministry is this, and I, I've, I've often said it this way, the biggest mistake that Satan ever made was in crucifying Jesus. Before the crucifixion, when Jesus was talking to the woman at the well, he was nowhere else. Nowhere else. When the woman, when Mary was washing his feet, he was nowhere else. But now, where does he live? That's right. He's everywhere. He's within our lives. Now the devil's really got a problem. See, he's everywhere. So just as there was an intensity of ministry, an intensity of ministry of miracles that led to the cross, in our day the Lord is preparing a corporate Jesus, a corporate body. We're the body, he's the head. He's preparing a corporate witness that is going to be empowered with ministry, with authority such as this world has never seen. And that ministry, that anointing, will lead to the kingdom. The five foot eight Jesus, his ministry led to the cross. The corporate Jesus, we his body, that ministry will lead to the kingdom. The Lord's getting ready to do a profound thing. Just as there was that witness, Jesus witnessed to this world. And he was crucified. Now when Stephen was martyred, I'm going to read a verse in a minute. When Stephen was martyred, he looked up, he saw Jesus standing, the heavens opened, and the glory of the Lord shone upon him. And the Jews of that day said, isn't this wonderful? No, they didn't. If you read the book, what did they do? They ran on him, in, like they gnashed their teeth, and they ran on him in anger, and they stoned him. Now, the Lord showed me something recently. Saul of Tarsus was holding their cloaks when they stoned him. He saw Stephen glorified. He saw it. I believe it pricked him to his heart. Why kick you against the pricks? He was pricked to his heart. He saw the glory of God. He desired the Lord. He was serving the Lord in the knowledge that he had. But he saw the glory. He could not escape it. And I believe that Saul of Tarsus began to pray, Lord, if this is really you, if this thing is real, I saw your glory on Stephen. I want to experience that. Visit me if this is real. Visit. I, begin, I believe he began to pray and the Lord appeared to him. He was going out on his horse. He saw Jesus glorified so much so he fell from his horse. He was blinded by the glory. 
Now, this witness, this end time witness, the Lord is preparing a corporate body that are going to receive the greatest move of God that this world's ever seen. It's not in the pulpit. The pulpit refers to the fivefold ministry that's equipping the body for the work of ministry. The anointing today is moving from the pulpit into the body. It's moving. Glory. Hallelujah. There's no more Benny Hinn's, Oral Roberts, Catherine Kuhlman's. That day's gone. So I want to say what I have to say up here. And I want to get out of here and get down there and sit down because I want to be a part of that which the Lord's about to do. He's moving. He's equipping. He's preparing the body for this move. Ye shall be witnesses. Now, Isaiah chapter 60 for just a moment. Isaiah chapter 60. This word has never been fulfilled. This is a present day word. And the world is about to see a demonstration of God. Again, when Jesus ministered, it led to the cross, to his resurrection and his ascension and the birthing of the church. When the Lord begins to move in, as we becoming that end time witness, this end time witness, there'll be that intensity of ministry. It will lead to the tribulation, not the cross, the tribulation. The result of the tribulation will be the outworking of that, will be the establishing of the kingdom of God. The Lord's going to use us in that. Now, arise, shine, for your light is come. The glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be what? What does it say? Seen. Seen. Upon who? Upon, upon us. The glory is going to be what? Seen. Seen. Now the Lord's getting us ready. The Lord will share ministry. He'll share anointings. If I'm anointed, whatever I do, I'll do it better. If I'm anointed. Whatever I do, if I'm anointed, I'll do it better. But when the glory hits me, I'll fall apart. I'll end up on the floor. You know, I'll fall apart. I can't function. The priest couldn't minister for the glory. You cannot function in the glory. We have to become conditioned, prepared. And the Lord's doing that. The gold dust. I was in a meeting, what, about four days ago in Texas. And I know I did these gold specks all, all over me. And the Lord's doing that in this day. He's moving in special ways. His glory shall be seen. I believe this, this gold dust, or whatever you call it, the people are talking about. It's preparation for the glory, the Lord preparing, letting us know this body, the temple. The Lord said, I counsel thee to purchase of me what? Gold. gold. Tried in the fire, the preparation. He'll share gifts and ministries. He will not share his glory. That means there's a processing of getting ready to enter in, to be that vessel that the Lord's going to reveal his glory through. But just as Jesus, the five foot eight Jesus, witnessed to this world, which led to the cross to the, to, and then to glory, so today, through the corporate Jesus, you and I, his body, there's going to be a witness to this earth, an intensity of witness that will lead to tribulation, because they're going to, they're, they're not going, there's those that will not receive or respond, but it'll lead to tribulation and then to the kingdom of glory. Now, his glory shall be seen upon thee. Verse 3, and the Gentiles shall come to your light. That word Gentiles is better translated sinners, the sinners. There are no sinners in heaven. So this is not talking about heaven someday in the future, you know, that we're all going to walk on streets of gold and sweep by and by. This is a present word. The Gentiles will come, shall come to your light, to the glory. There are those that are sincere, that are hungry. Now they'll come. There's two ways in which they'll come. They'll come and they'll repent and become a part of what the Lord's doing. 
or like those of old that ran on Stephen, they'll stone you. <laughs> there is a persecution in the last days. They'll either repent and respond. There are those, because of the intensity of revelation, will literally cry for the rocks to fall on them. Why? Because authority is going to be restored in this visitation. That just as Jesus had authority, the demons were subject, they responded, there's an authority, an end time authority. And those in this day that are possessed will be set free, such as this world has never seen. Hallelujah. Glory. Now the Lord. Mm, thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. See, the Lord is getting a people ready for that which he's about to do in this day. Now, I want to come back to Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. For just a moment, then we'll go from there. I stand at the door. This is the end of the church age. We are there. The Lord is ready to reveal himself through the body. He's taking his place. I stand at the door. That speaks of his presence. There's two words, primary words in the Greek for, for the coming of the Lord. One is erikomai. That's, we're here, we're, pre, we're right here in substance, in reality, erikomai. But there's another word that's used almost 30 times in the New Testament. And many of the passages of scripture that refer to the coming of the Lord use this word, it's parousia. The parousia has to do with the presencing of the Lord. And I'm believing and looking to the Lord for all at once for his presence, his parousia to flood this room. When the Lord appeared and disappeared, that's parousia, not erikomai. That was before when he was present, before the crucifixion. Now he appeared and all at once he was gone. He vanished from their sight, parousia. And we're in the time of the parousia when the Lord's going to begin appearing. We can expect, see the same Jesus, just as you see him, what? Go, he'll come. What did he do for 40 days? He appeared, parousia. He's coming for those that love his appearance in Timothy. And so that's parousia. So the Lord is, is, is beginning to presence himself increasingly to prepare us for that which is before us, that which he's about to do. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, hearing my ability to hear, and I thank the Lord for the amount of spiritual hearing that I have, but I would like to hear more. I'd like to hear better. See, I'd like to hear more. I'd like to hear better. And I'm believing the Lord to cultivate that ability to hear. You see, that ability has to be cultivated. It's something that we have to do. It's not just, you know, a baby when it's first born. It hears, but it doesn't understand. And gradually, the sound. I like Psalm 42.7, and the other, most, almost every, every new translation ruins it. Deep call it to deep, at the noise of your water spouts. The new, all the newer translations say at the sound of your waterfall, Psalm 42, 7. That ruins it. At the noise of your water spout. These water spouts happen two places in the world, outside of Jerusalem and in Hong Kong Harbor. And it's, a, it's, it's the wind that literally whips the rain, that rain that falls on the fields of the just and unjust, it whips the rain into a horizontal funnel of water. It, the rain, instead of coming down, it's whipped into a funnel, then all at once it dumps on somebody. That's favor, approbation. See, the favor of God. All that coming. See, at the noise of your water spouts. It's noise because in the beginning we don't really fully understand. But in Revelation 5, it says they sang a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book, to open the seals, for thou wast slain, and hath redeemed us from every kindred, tongue, people, and nation, and hath made us, this is where we are, forget, hath made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign. Where? What's the rest of that? Where? 
on the earth. Everybody's trying to get out of here. <laughs> Going to reign where? On the earth. Reign means that's governmental. That means the Lord's about to restore authority. But he's given authority in the past and it's been misused. It's been exploited. So he's preparing a people that he can trust with glory, with authority, that will use it wisely and rightly to bring about his purpose and his will to accomplish it. Now, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. That speaks of his parousia, his manifested presence. This is a present end time word. Not just spiritually as we've had down through 2,000 years that, the, that we just somehow have a sense, but I believe literally the Lord's going to begin appearing to equip, to prepare us for this end time witness in the earth. I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. In other words, there'll be that impartation for end time ministry, anointing will take place. Now, we need then to cultivate the ability to hear. I'm going to take just a little longer. We'll work through this and then we'll be finished. On this cultivating our ability to hear. Psalm 119, verse 25. It's a beautiful word. And it, it, this is right where we are. Psalm 119. This is the real long one. Psalm 119. Probably the greatest need we have is to realize that we have a need. I mean, the, in, in the right sense of the word, to really understand it from the Lord's perspective. When, once we begin to recognize that we have a need and we rightly respond to it, that releases the Lord to move in intervention. Psalm 119, verse 25. My soul cleaveth to the dust. In other words, primarily, I respond to earthly things. My whole being is towards the earthly. But in Revelation 4, that, that's, this is a, the, Lord, the word, the Lord is knocking, why? I looked, I looked, and a voice said, what? Come up, come up, come up, and come up, a voice as a trumpet, a trumpet is a call to action. Come up, and I will show you things which must be hereafter. That's a heavenly hearing. Now, for most of us, we're taken up with earthly hearing, with sensitivity. Most people are concerned about how to make better investments, you know, worldly people in the stock market, and, all concerned about YK2 and what they should do and, you know, about world conditions and where we're at and how to survive from one day. You know, we're all the earthly things, relationships, all these things that are involved, we're taken up with these things. But the Lord is calling the people to look up and begin to listen to what? The heavenly, which means we have to let loose of the earthly and trust the Lord. When the angel came to Mary, when Gabriel came to Mary and said, I have needed, the Lord has need of thee. She said, there's nothing in me that qualifies me for what you're asking. It's impossible, but I'm willing. And that's all the Lord wants. We recognize the impossibility, we confess it, and then we express our willingness. My soul cleaveth to the dust. That's the norm. We're taken up with earthly things. I trust some of us are getting dealt with about all kind of newspapers and television, and, you know, all these earthly things. Because we have to, those things have a way of, see the eye is the gate to the soul. And these things have a way of corrupting our ability to hear. And if I'm to hear, if I'm expecting the Lord's going to begin appearing, if I really believe this, that we're in that time, we're at the end of the church age, and the Lord's about to begin appearing, then I'm going to prepare myself in anticipation. I'm, he's coming for people who are looking Amen. for his appearing. Therefore, I'm going to look upward, heavenward, and I'm going to begin to believe. 
that the Lord's going to appear in expectancy. And if I'm believing and seeking it, it's going to happen. You know that thing about Paul that I shared? He saw Stephen being stoned. He saw the glory. When he saw it, in a sense, you know, if you've ever seen the glory, you'll be ruined forever. You'll never be satisfied with anything less. There's nothing in this world that can compare to a touch of visitation. We've had a couple times here. We've had powerful touches of the Lord. The Lord has moved. I wish that I wish it was a hundred times more, both in 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 in, in, in you know intensity and a hundred times more often. But I long for that. And I'm believing for it. And this is a corporate thing. I just want to say something here. These meetings. I believe it's very important because the Lord today is moving. He's preparing a corporate expression. We're the body. The head, the per in the parousia, he's taking his place as the head. Not of an individual, but of a corporate body. He's preparing a corporate witness. We individually, in our part and portion, we reflect that witness. But the Lord comes, moves on us, imparts to us in a corporate setting. Therefore, it's very important that we, we're gathered. Now, I think meetings like this, house meetings, are very important. I'll tell you why. I can say this anywhere in the country. I've said it in California and all over the place, in Texas and in between. When you go to church on Sunday morning, and people laugh when I say this. They actually they'll laugh right out loud because it's happened. When you go to church on Sunday morning, and you wonder if so-and-so is there. You know exactly where to look to see if they're there. Is that right? Because yes. we're creatures of habit. We all sit, see, when you, on Sunday morning, if you go to a regular church, you know where to look to see if so-and-so is there. That means we fall, not just that, but we fall into a mold, like, like a mold in the service. The fun, we don't realize it. We don't realize it. But in a meeting like this, we're from many different churches, fellowships. There's, no, there's nothing being built other. This is a, a meeting, period. And my goal and desire is, is that in the sense of whatever church you belong to, that whatever church you belong to, that because you've been here, you'll become a better member of that church. And that's, that's my desire. So no pastor needs to be feel threatened. But we're here, we're, we're independent of that. We're free from that mold. In a house meeting, when you gather, you're, you're much more relaxed and you're free. And I believe the Lord can begin to say things beyond what you've been hearing because that mold is broken and you can hear something fresh and new because the Lord is saying something new now. The Word is taking on a kingdom orientation. Come up. And I will show you things which must be hereafter. My soul cleaveth to the dust. Confession. But there's a prayer. What is it? Quicken me according to your word. Quicken me. That word quicken means to bring me into the flow of his presence, of the supernatural. That quickening has to do with the parousia. It's the appearing, the presencing. See, it's presence as a feeling, but as that intenses, intensified, that feeling of presence will become the person. And all at once, the Lord's going to be standing there. And we're going to see it in our day. Many of you are going to see it. The Lord's going to appear. Both corporately and individually, you're going to see it. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Quicken me. That means that I'm going to make an honest effort to prepare myself. When you pray, Jesus said, do what? Go into your closet. That is, get alone. Open up your heart. Trust the Lord to deal. That door. See, behold, I stand at the door. What is that door? The door is that which is between where we are and where we would like to be. Amen? We, we're all very aware of it. If you've ever locked your keys in the car, you can look through, you, you know, you can see them, but it doesn't help much. <laughs> There's something in between where you, where you are and where you would like to be. 
And that door represents, but because we're, this is the end of the seventh church, that Jesus is knocking, not down through the church age, he was doing other things. But at the end of the seventh church, at the end of the seventh church, which is where we are, he's knocking. He's, he's, reve he's desiring now, I will come in. This is an intensity, his presence, and I'm going to say this. The presence of the Lord is available to us today as never before. No one else in the church age has ever had the privilege that we have. To whom much is given, it's required. There's preparation then of getting ready. We're at the end now. Quicken me, Lord. Quicken me. Prepare me, Lord. I want to be ready when you visit. I want to be ready. In such an hour, as you know not, that means I'm going to live in the sense of being available. My goal, look up. Look up. I looked up. Now, the closet. I'm going to get alone with the Lord and let him deal with that which is between where I am, where I would like to be. See, he's knocking. He's present. He'll bring it to our attention and it can, their correction can come. It's that which stands between where I am, where I would like to be. And the Lord will deal with that. That's that. There's a method. I'm not going to get into this. I'm going to save this for another time. The Lord's Prayer. I want to go through that in detail. Our Father, which art in heaven. That's not something to recite in a service. It's a method of approach to come into the presence of the Lord. It's preparation. And there's a whole progression there, and I want to save that. Now, there's something more. There was a household that Jesus loved to visit. The household of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. If you go to the Holy Land, I'm told that there's a sign on a pile of rocks, and it, said, it is believed that this was the house of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Well, that may be, but the house that Jesus, because see, he's knocking on the door, not to that house. He did that about 2,000 years ago. He knocked on the door of that house, but because there was something in that house that attracted his attention, he, that was something very special. He wanted to go to that house. Now, the word says that we're built together for what? A what? A habitation. Thank you. We're built together for... See, we're the house. And he's knocking on the door. But by the grace of God, I want to believe that the door that he's knocking on is the door to my heart, to my life. That he's going to come within my life. He's going to begin to unfold, to reveal, to make himself presently available. He's going to do that. But there was something that attracted him. There were three people that lived in that house. Mary, Martha, Lazarus. Now, there's three aspects to our lives, to that which, to this house. Because we're to reveal that we're made in the image and likeness of God, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We are made to fully reflect that likeness in that the Lord made his body, soul, and spirit. A threefold aspect, Mary, Martha, Lazarus. But there was something that was interesting. When Jesus came <clears throat> into that house, Martha began to serve. I said in a meeting once that Jesus really liked apple pie. So when he came, Martha got busy and started to bake an apple pie, and she complained because Mary wouldn't help her peel the apples. Well, I got a letter from a lady later and she said, I've searched my Bible. She said, I've looked in the commentaries and I can't find that any place. She said, where does it say that? <laughs> well, I said, I wrote back to her and I said, well, there's two, there, there's two approaches to scripture. One is translation. The other is application. I said, this is application. But, you know, it's probably pretty close to right. I'm not sure what it was. But anyway, she... See, Martha served. But Mary did what? She sat at his feet. 
And what was wrong with Lazarus? He was sick. Well, he was sick. All right, now, Martha, our service, the things that we do. Mary, our devotional life. Lazarus, the Adamic nature. What's wrong with the Adamic nature? It's sick. It's sick. Lazarus is sick. And service and devotion continually was trying to get Jesus to heal the Adamic nature. And he said, I'm not going to do it. But instead, I'm going to resurrect it. Now, I want, now, now we're going to turn to a verse. It's in, it's in John chapter 12, the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John chapter 12. Well, chapter 11, we'll go there first. <clears throat> Verse 5. John chapter 11, verse 5. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. If any minister did that, when somebody in his congregation was sick and he went on a fishing trip for two days, he'd be in trouble. But Jesus stayed away for two days. Now, a day is as a thousand years. The church age is how old? Two thousand years, or two days. So the Adamic nature, the weakness, that which we struggle with, for two thousand years, it's sick. Glory. Mm. I hope we're headed towards something kind of special that very few see. He, he stayed away for 2,000 years. We prayed, we've struggled with all our problems, our things. We've looked for that. The Adamic nature is sick. Been sick for 2,000 years, but we're at the, the doorway that leads into the kingdom. Something's about to happen. We're in a time of transition. So, but at the end of the second day, what did he do? He revealed himself. Notice verse 35. Jesus said to her, what's the next two words? Anybody there? John chapter 11, verse 25. Jesus said to her, I am. Not I was or I will be. See, this is present right now. I am. All that he was or will be, see, he's an eternal present God. I am the resurrection. And finally, with a loud voice, he said, Lazarus, come forth. This is that end time ministry at the end of the second day. There's a, we're going to be lifted out of the earthly, that doorway. Lazarus, come forth. Loose him. And let him go. That's something they had to do. At the end of the second day, behold, I stand at what? The door. See? He stayed away for two days. But when he came, he revealed himself as the I am. And then he said, Lazarus, come forth. That door, the hindrance between where we are, where we desire to be, there's a, there is a lifting, creative power, a present word in preparation for that restoration of glory for what the Lord's about to do. And Lazarus was released. Now, we have a picture of this in chapter 12. Six days before the Passover. Again, Six days, the end of the sixth day, this is an end time word. And they made him a supper. This is the marriage supper of the Lamb. Martha, see, our, our service perfected for the higher purpose of the Lord. We're going to become that witness. Martha served. But Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table. Now, to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne at the table. 
Then Mary took a pound of ointment. So here we have service, the ultimate, the marriage supper of the Lamb, perfected, overcoming power and life, Lazarus sitting with the Lord in his throne. Then Mary, the ultimate sacrifice, a pouring out her very life before the Lord in that relationship. The Lord's preparing a people for that day to get us ready by the grace of God. Hallelujah. Mm. I hath not seen nor heard what God has for them who love Him. I mentioned earlier at the noise of your water spouts when we believe for the approbation, the favor, the intervention, for God to become personally active, when we hold ourselves before the Lord like Mary of old, say, I'm available, I'm willing in the day of your power, as we do this, as we believe, glory, hmm. in that day, in that day, the noise we don't understand today, but if we'll believe looking forward, we may feel like Lazarus. You know, we're all bound up. That door, the hindrances. We're sick. But the Lord has it. The Lord's going to lift us. That word's going to come. See, there's a point of intervention. And this witness, this end time witness, is going to go out. Just as Jesus witnessed, the world's going to see an end time witness. And then, I'm going to read this. It's Revelation chapter 5, and then we're all finished. Revelation chapter 5, verse 10. At the noise, but now they sang a new song. You see, now we understand. We're in His presence. We're a part of that which He's doing. Thou hath made us the processings. See, our submission to His dealings. That time of preparation, when we begin to look up, when we realize that no longer are we to be bound, my soul cleaveth to the dust. There are those that will begin to look up and believe for the greater, for the higher. Have made us unto our God kings and priests. The king, that's earthly authority. The priest, heavenly authority. And we shall what? Reign. There's an authority. The Lord's going to demonstrate His power on this earth. I just want to say this. Before there's any change in the present day situation of things, the Lord is preparing a body of overcomers through whom He's going to demonstrate His power to the world. Met, the world has never seen that, but they're about to see it. And it's not going to be true of a new breed of talented Oral Roberts, Catherine Kuhlman's, Benny Hinn's, but rather very simple people without charisma, personality, without any great abilities. Guy, he's going out into the highways and byways. He's choosing that which is not to bring to naught that which is. And if you've wondered why you've gone through many of the things you're going through, because the Lord's getting you ready. Because as he moves on you in that demonstration of his power, the world will know that it's not you, but God. Glory. Hallelujah. Amen. We're about to see it. Amen. Okay. Let's all stand. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Father, somehow, Lord, quicken us, stir us. Open truly, Lord, the eyes of our understanding that we might grasp that which you're about to do in the earth. These broken words, Lord, we're seeing in part, but help us to understand to become a part of that, Lord, which you're about to do. Oh, Lord, I thank you for the privilege that we have of being gathered here 
in the capital, not only of this world, but in the minds of the anti Antichrist, the government of the world, centered in Washington, D.C. And right here, Lord, you're going to raise up a mighty witness of your power. For indeed, Lord, the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And I ask, Lord, this day that we might begin to grasp, to understand, to enter in to that which you're doing in the earth in this day. We're asking, Lord, your visitation to each of us personally. But more, Lord, in these conference meetings, we're asking your presence mightily visiting, moving upon us, lifting us, and we thank you.